Hey guys, Political Junkie 2414 here, and welcome back to my next election prediction video. Today, um, when I'm recording this, it is officially October 1st, 2022. Happy Saturday, everybody. Happy October. This is my favorite month of the year. Very uh, nice time. Uh, you know, I love Halloween and all that stuff. And uh, yeah, we are today we're going to be doing my updated look at the 2022 U.S. Senate elections. We are just a month away from the 2022 midterms. Um, I believe a week from today will mark the one um, the one month point officially, October 8th, 2022, one month out. Um, you know, of course, it's a week before, but it is essentially just one week or not one week, one month out from the midterm elections. We've got 38 days until the big day, the big midterms. These are some of the most important elections of our lifetime. We've got a lot on the, you know, on the ballot this year. I know that we always hear that, you know, these are the most important elections of our lifetimes. It's become a cliche, but you know, this is quite literally a very special election. Uh, you know, I know that we all have different views. We all, you know, are very, we have a very divided country. Hopefully we can, you know, find some common ground and hopefully we can, you know, we can build towards a better future in America. You know, we've been talking about these midterms for so long, you know, I'm excited to move on to 2024, but I am very excited, of course, to see what pans out on November 8th and see how the next two years of Congress and, you know, the politics as a whole in the country are going to go. Um, yeah, it seems like just yesterday, I, you know, it was September and we said we had two months out. We're getting closer and closer. You know, it seems like it's been a long journey, but, you know, once you actually get to the midterms or get to whatever, you know, you've been looking for, uh, it, it seems like that it was just yesterday that you were talking about how long away it was. It's funny how time works that way. So, uh, yeah, let's get started with our 2022 Senate uh, updated Senate prediction, at least mine. Uh, so we're going to start by filling out these safe Democratic states. These are the states that are going to go to the Democrats by um, over 15 percentage points. I'll talk a little bit about a couple of them just because there have been some interesting polls out of the state, out of some of these states. Connecticut has been a little bit closer. Richard Blumenthal is running for his re-election, and I did have this race as likely Democratic earlier in my prediction history, but since the start of the summer, it has been a uh, safe blue state. Republicans didn't really nominate the most electable candidate in the state. There has, you know, there is a pretty um, competitive, there is a fairly competitive governor's race in Connecticut, but that's not really going to affect Blumenthal. He's, an, a, mass, he's a massive overachiever. He pretty much ran even with his polls in 2016. In fact, he um, outran some of them. And I do think that while this race will be a little bit closer, Laura Levy is just not a good candidate. Um, you know, it is surprising Blumenthal is only up by 14.7%, just under a safe margin. But I do believe he's going to win by closer to uh, 20 percentage points at the end of the day. So Connecticut, no chance of going Republican, really might be under 15%. It might be likely, but I don't really see it right now. In Washington, I know we. I keep saying we're not going to talk about this race anymore. Jafalga released some more polls showing the race being competitive. I think it will be closer than it was in 2016, but... I mean, Patty Marie was never really in danger of, of losing the Senate race. It could have been a little bit closer. You know, you know, there was, you know, some consideration about this race being a little bit closer, um, you know, than, uh, than, you know, 15%. I, you know, when I started out my predictions, I had it as likely Democratic, but since the, st um, the middle of uh, July, I've had it as safe Democratic. Murray trounced all of her opponents in the open primary in Washington, which te which um, tends to give Democrats 5 or 6% less of the vote than they get in the general. And I do think that Murray will outperform her polls. I think she'll win by around 15, 16, maybe 17 points, but I don't think she's going to outrun her 2016 margin of 18 points. Um, but she could in a best case scenario. So, yeah. So that's it for the safe Democratic states. And uh, yeah, let's go on to the safe Republican states. Uh, we got Idaho, Alaska, both of Oklahoma's special um, or Senate elections, there have been some wonky polls showing the races close. Um, I think the special election might be a little bit closer with Mark Wayne Mullen, just because, you know, Oklahoma's open elections tend to be a little bit more competitive, but it's still the federal race and Republicans are going to win this race pretty solidly. Kansas might be a little bit interesting. You know, it has been a little bit closer. Jerry Moran, I think in the most recent poll by uh, conducted by Emerson, only showed him up by, I believe it was 12 points. Let's uh, look. Let's go to Kansas. Uh, 
Yes, yeah, Moran plus 12. We've seen some fairly close margins um, for the incumbent Republican against Mark Holland, but this race, you know, really doesn't have a chance of flipping to the Democrats. The governor's race is going to be a lot more competitive. Um, you know, it could get to likely in a best case scenario, but Moran almost always wins by solid, by very strong margins. He's an overachiever. He won by 30 points in 2016 when Trump won the state by 21. So yeah, so Jerry Moran's probably going to have a pretty solid victory in Kansas. I think it'll be closer than it was last time. You know, I think Mark Holland's an okay Dem uh, Democratic candidate, but it's Kansas. It's still a very red state, even though, you know, it's a lot more blue down ballot. South Dakota and North Dakota are going to be very solid for the GOP. Missouri is going to be solid because, you know, even though Trudy Bush Valentine's running a, an okay campaign, it's still Missouri. Eric Schmidt was the right candidate. It might fall below 15%. But even then, you know, Schmidt is very close to cracking, um, you know, 15 point margins in some of these polls. You know, he's up by like 10, 11, 12, 13. So I think that he can definitely win by, by a safe margin. And so I do think he's going to outrun his polls by a bit. But I do think it'll be around uh, Trump's 15 point victory in 2020. Arkansas and Louisiana are going to be very um, solid for the GOP. Alabama, we had an interesting primary here to here to replace a uh, retiring Republican Senator Richard Shelby. Um, Katie Britt, of course, won that um, elect, uh, won that Senate runoff to replace him, and she is almost certainly going to be the next senator from the state of Alabama. She will be, she will make history this November um, as, you know, the uh, first female senator ever, or female, you know, the first woman ever elected to us, um, to the U.S. Senate from Alabama. There have been female um, women uh, in the U.S. Senate from the state before, but none of them have been elected. So Katie Britt's going to make history this year. It's going to be very interesting to see Alabama elect its first female senator. And uh, yeah, let's just, uh, yeah, that uh, Alabama, an interesting primary, but it's not going to be competitive at all in the general election. South Carolina also going to be very solid for Tim Scott, and Kentucky and Indiana going to be very solid for the GOP as well. Although Kentucky might narrow up because Rand Paul is, you know, an under, you know, he does typically underperform Republicans, but his Democratic opponent, Charles Booker, is very progressive, and he's not going to do well enough to get it under 15 points. You know, he really doesn't have a chance at flipping this seat. Um, if Democrats had nominated a more moderate candidate, I think that this race could have been a little bit closer, but even then, that's a bit of a stretch. So yeah, so I think Rand Paul wins by around 20 to 25 points at the end of the day. So now we're going to get to the likely states. These are states that are going to go to either party by, um, you know, oh, and by the way, Democrats are now at 45 seats. Republicans are at 43 right now. And we're going to get to the likely states, which are states that are going to go to either party by 5 to 15 points. These aren't states that are super competitive, but they do, you know, they will fall beyond, um, below 15%. Some of them are a lot more, you know, competitive than others. And uh, yeah, so likely states, it's, you know, it's a big range but uh, yeah, we're going to start off with the um with uh, on the west coast. We got the state of Utah. Um, Evan McMullen is doing surprisingly well in some of these polls. I know that Utah's polls underestimated Trump by quite a bit in 2020. Mike Lee is a very unpopular incumbent though, and I think McMullen does stand a chance at winning this race. Uh, you know, I had this race as safe red because I thought that he would caucus with the GOP if he did win. Um, I still fully expect Republicans to win in Utah, although it is, you know, a traditionally conservative state, and McMullen does have very, you know, a lot of appeal in the state. Um, I still just don't think it's going to be, you know, it's not going to be a particularly close margin. I think it'll be just under a safe uh, margin, a, a safe uh, margin for the incumbent Republican Mar Mike Lee. But you know, this race could get a little bit more interesting. And uh, yeah, let's we'll just have to see how Utah plays out. Um, I don't think that McMullen would caucus with either party, you know, just like he said if he was elected. But you know, politicians don't always keep their promises, and I could see Lee um, winning by more than fifteen points. Um, you know, but he's only up by seven right now. He's underperforming Trump, uh, his margin uh, in uh, twenty twenty, and Lee's a massive margin in twenty sixteen. So I think Lee wins by a lot less than he did last time around, but he still wins regardless. The next likely state for the Republicans is the state of Iowa. Chuck Grassley is going to win his reelection. Um, it's going to be very close to a safe margin. You know, he's an overachiever and, you know, he is only up by seven points in the polls. Um, polarization, I think, you know, really is catching up to Grassley considering, you know, his massive margins in the state in the past. 
I think he'll win by, you know, double digits. Michael Franken doesn't really stand a chance of winning this race, but I do think, you know, considering Grassley is, you know, less uh, margins getting smaller and smaller as the years go on, I do think that it will fall below uh, 15 points. But if we start to see more polls that show Grassley doing a lot better, I will move this back up to safe. But, you know, even Selzer, which is a very accurate pollster in Iowa, um, you know, they... They predicted Trump winning by a pretty sizable margin in the state in 2020 when everyone else said it was pretty much a dead heat between Biden and Trump. Um, you know, they only have Grassley up by eight. I think that that will, you know, I think that they'll be wrong by a couple of points. I think that Grassley wins by around 13 or 14 points. So, uh, yeah, very close to safe, safe by probability, but likely by margin. The last likely state for the Republicans is the state of Florida. It has gotten a little bit more competitive between Marco Rubio and Val Demings. I think that, you know, a lot of people wrote off this race from the start being unattainable for the Democrats. And I still don't think that realistically it's going to go blue. In the best case scenario, Val Demings could win, but Florida polls, you know, usually do overestimate Democrats by quite a bit. Biden was up by almost three points on election day in 2020. He lost the state by three to Trump. It's a right trending state, and Rubio is a very strong incumbent. Um, I do think it might be closer than 2016, uh, you know, when he only won by, um, or not when he only won, but when Rubio won by eight points, he outperformed Trump by quite a bit. Um, I don't think it's going to be a double digit margin for Rubio anymore. But I do think it'll be, you know, around his margin in 2016, if not a, a, a hair smaller. So, yeah, I think Rubio will outperform his polls by quite a bit, but he's still not going to do, you know, he's still, you know, Val Demings is still going to give him a run for his money. I think she'll do well. I think she'll do, you know, okay in Miami-Dade County, but I still, you know, it is still the right trending area. And Rubio being Hispanic is going to help him with, you know, Cuban voters that really shifted rightward in 2020. So now we're going to fill in the two likely Democratic states. The first one is the state of Colorado. I've become a lot less confident in Joe Dea's chances at winning this race based on Colorado's, you know, shift to the left. It was never really going to go to Odea. You know, Bennett, Michael Bennett's a very strong incumbent. And polls in Colorado, you know, right now show Bennett up by nine points. And Democrats have, you know... Mo, uh, you know, in almost every case scenario, similar to, to Nevada, but not to the same extent, have outperformed polling in Colorado. Bennett was supposed to lose the Senate race in 2010. He ended up winning it by two. So, you know, that's a favor in his cap. And he did outperform Hillary Clinton in 2016. You know, he was one of the only Democrats, you know, down ballot to do better than Hillary Clinton did in, um, you know, in a Senate election. Um, than Clinton did in, you know, the the presidential, on the presidential level, John McCain did better, or Ann Kirkpatrick did worse than Clinton, uh, Jim Barksdale did worse than Clinton in Georgia, uh, Katie McGinty and Russ Feingold did worse than Clinton in uh, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Jason Kander did do a lot better though, but Roy Blunt was very unpopular, Maggie Hassan did a lot worse than, uh, you know, or not, not a lot worse, but she did run slightly behind Clinton, New Hampshire was very close though, and we will get to that state in a second. So I think Bennett wins by more than he did in 2016, but I still don't think, you know, it's going to be a complete blowout for Odea. I think he'll do well in the Denver suburbs, but, you know, even moderate Republicans are struggling with suburban voters. Um, you know, even though Odea is pro-choice and he is pro, you know, LGBT rights, which, which does help him in a state as, you know, socially liberal as Colorado, I still think Bennett wins by around 9 to 10 points. So, yeah, I think that that's pretty much the uh, gauge of the race right now, but it could be a little bit closer. We just don't know. I don't think it will be, though. I think Bennett wins by a pretty uh, sizable amount when it's all said and done. The second likely state that we have is the state of New Hampshire. I think that, you know, Don Bolduc isn't quite as bad as, as a candidate as I was anticipating. You know, he's moderated his position on the 2020 election a little bit. But New Hampshire is still a state that voted for Biden by, you know, seven points in 2020. It does swing a lot, um, you know, which does make a, an argument for uh, Don Bolduc. It's not, it's one of the most swingy of swing states in the nation, even though it almost always votes blue. It can vote, you know, for a Democrat by seven points, and then four years later, it can vote for them by, you know, less than a percentage point. But Hassan... Uh, Maggie Hassan's a very strong incumbent. She's won in red wave years before. I don't think 2022 is really a red wave anymore. I think it's a pretty neutral year um, right now. But New Hampshire, you know, is a state where Roe v. Wade is going to play a major impact. 
and Hassan, you know, really got lucky with Sununu not running and with Chuck Morris losing the nomination. So yeah, and these new polls reflect that. I don't think Hassan's winning by 13 or 11. I don't even think she's going to win by 8. I think she'll win by around 6 or 7 points when it's all said and done. Maybe 5, but you know, I think that she could she could, you know, win by only a lean margin, you know, cuz New Ham but New Hampshire's polls, you know, do tend to be pretty accurate. They were wrong in 2020 by a couple of points. But, I mean, 2020 was just such a bad year for polls all around, and New Hampshire, besides that, has been a pretty solid state in terms of polling. They were pretty accurate in 2016 and, uh, you know, in the presidential race and the Senate race. Um, now we're going to get into the lean states. So Democrats are now at 47 seats, Republicans are at 46. We got seven uh, remaining states to uh, characterize. And uh, these are going to be the lean and tilt states. We'll start with the lean states. These are states that are going to go to either party, um, you know, by uh, one to five points. These are pretty close states, but they're not, um, you know, in incredibly close. I would ca characterize some of these as, you know, potent I, I, you know, wouldn't be opposed to characterizing some of these races as toss-ups, but they're still, um, you know, pretty... Uh, they're pretty competitive, but they do have, you know, a pretty clear lean towards either party. We're going to start off in the state of Arizona. Mark Kelly is still wiping the floor with Blake Masters. I think he is going to underrun, underperform his polls by quite a bit like he did in 2020. But he's up by, you know, 7 points in the 538 polling average. Real clear politics, you know, which had, which was pretty much the most accurate polling, had the most accurate average for the Senate election in 2020. They had Kelly up um, by 5. He's up by 5 now. I, you know, Blake Masters just, you know, like uh, Don Bolduc has been trying to moderate his positions, particularly on abortion, um, you know, and I just do not think that, I, 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 you know, I could be wrong. I think Mark Kelly is still pretty vulnerable. He's in a, you know, a Biden plus um, 0.3 state. You know, Arizona is a very competitive state and he only won by two in 2020. But Blake Masters just really does not have a lot of appeal, you know, He's significantly underperforming Carrie Lake, and I do think that when it's all said and done, Arizona votes for Kelly by around anywhere from 2 to 4 percentage points. Could even be likely in a best-case scenario. We'll just have to see how the polls end up in the state, but Arizona's polls aren't that far up. You know, they weren't too super far off in, um, in 2020, and in 2018, they actually underestimated Democratic support. But I don't think Kelly's going to win by 7 for the record. I think it's around... Two to four percent as of right now. I think Masters will, you know, do worse than Martha McSally did. You know, even McSally led in a couple of polls by this time in uh, twenty twenty. Masters still has yet to win it in a single pollster. Data for Progress does show the race being a little bit closer than it should be. They only have Kelly up by one, but remember this is the same pollster that had Mark Molinaro winning by eight in that special election in New York, and we all know how that turned out. So, you know. Don't don't listen to data for progress. They do usually skew to the left, but in you know more recent years, they've you know in more recent elections, they've been pretty bullish on Republicans. They've been you know trying to over overcompensate for their polling misses in twenty twenty. So that's my thought on Arizona. You know, I think Mark Kelly wins in uh you know the state. I don't think that really you know Republicans are going to you know make too much of a dent or going to improve too much between uh you know now and and uh you know a month from now. McConnell does, you know, Mitch McConnell's taken out money from Arizona and it just doesn't look very good for Blake Masters right now. You know, I think Carrie Lake has a much better chance of winning the governor's race against Katie Hobbs than Mark Kelly does, at, you know, than Blake Masters does at defeating Mark Kelly. But I could be wrong. You know, Arizona's still very competitive. You know, I just don't see it right now for, um, for Blake Masters. The uh, second um, lean state for the Democrats is Pennsylvania. Dr. Oz is not a good candidate. He does seem to be gaining in the polls, but I mean, once again, we did expect the polls to narrow. No one really, you know, you should not have thought that Pennsylvania was going to go for Fetterman by, you know, double digits. He, you know, did, he is below 50% now, and Oz, you know, is starting to gain in some pollsters. He is, you know, coming close. But like Masters, he has not led it in a single poll in the state. He, you know, even Pat Toomey in 2016, who won a surprise victory, he was even leading in some polls against Katie McGinty at this point. And, you know, Fetterman, you know, I do I do think John Fetterman's a pretty good candidate. I, you know, I, I could be wrong. You know, Pennsylvania is a state that, you know, where Democrats do usually um, underperform polling data by quite a bit, but not, you know, not, not tremendously. They were pretty accurate in 2020, especially the real clear politics average, and they have Fetterman up by, I think, four right now. So, you know, I think Fetterman will win by 
you know, if the election was held today, I think that Fetterman would win by around um, three or four points. In November, I think it'll be a little bit closer. Oz is not completely out of this race yet, but Republicans are just really struggling in this state. They royally screwed up, and Doug Mastriano is not looking, you know, is looking, you know, like he's really doing badly as well in the state, and I don't see there being a lot of, you know, split ticketing, um, or, you know, sorry, not split ticketing, ticket splitting in the state of Pennsylvania right now. But, uh, yeah, that's where I stand on Pennsylvania. I've had it as Democratic, as a blue state for the entirety of my Senate predictions, it's been a little bit closer in some of them, but I still think, you know, Fetterman wins by pretty, you know, pretty good margin. So, uh, yeah, that's that's how I feel about Pennsylvania. So, uh, yeah, let's try to go um, go a little bit faster because this has taken a little while longer than I anticipated. So now we're going to get into the lean GOP states. The first one we have is the state of Ohio. We have continued to see polls that show the race pretty much neck and neck between Tim Ryan and J.D. Vance. I still think Vance is going to outrun uh, his polling numbers by quite a bit. He has, you know, taken a resurgence in the polls since, you know, the summer when he was pretty much down in, you know, every pollster by, you know, pretty big margins. But we never really believed those polls. We, you know, said Ohio has been a state where polls have been extremely inaccurate, even, you know, in years when Trump has not been on the ballot. Um, but, you know, and I do think that Vance will win probably by a likely margin in, you know, a month from now. But I think if the election was held right now, he would win by just under uh, five percentage points. Tim Ryan's a very good candidate. I think, you know, this race could potentially go to Democrats. It's, you know, the most likely it's ever been. And, you know, with the race, you know, the, the thing that makes this race so much more, you know, attainable, I think, for Democrats is because we're starting to see more realistic numbers, you know, which I guess you could argue means that Vance is going to do better than he would have if you know, polls continue to show Ryan decimating Vance. But, I mean, you know, Tim Ryan's doing a very good job, and Republicans, you know, I think Josh Mandel would have, you know, I don't think there would have been much of a difference between the candidate quality between Vance and Mandel. We all kind of wrote off this race from the beginning as, you know, a, a race that J.D. Vance was pretty much locked and loaded in. I, you know, I still think that he's absolutely going to win this race. It would take a lot for me to say that, um, Tim Ryan's going to win, but, you know, I could be wrong in the state, and it is um, looking like it's pretty, it's closer than both North Carolina, or it's looking like it's closer than Wisconsin, um, you know, and that is quite surprising. We'll talk about Wisconsin in just a second. Uh, the next lean state is the state of North Carolina. Sherry Beasley's doing very well in polling. It's currently, you know, pretty much tied on, you know, 538. They have the race. Um, they have bought up by 0.3%. It's very, very close. Um, you know, we've seen some, you know, we've seen that this signal poll, which, you know, was sponsored by, it's a Republican leaning pollster. They have Ted Budd and Sherry Beasley tied. I think Beasley does have, you know, a very good chance at winning the Senate race, but it really just depends on black turnout. I think that she'll do very, very well, you know, a lot better than, um, you know, expected with black turnout, but I think Bud is going, Ted Budd's going to do, um, a lot better than, um, you know, you... I think he's going to outperform his polls by just a little bit. He'll probably win by 1.5% if the election was held right now, and I think that's where it's going to be uh, a month from now. Uh, Beasley could very well take this race away, and, you know, I think that early voting, you know, with early voting start starting, I think we'll have a good idea, you know, just like unbiased election predictions said. I think we'll have, um, you know, a fairly good idea of how this race is going to turn out, um, you know, in the next couple of, of uh, weeks. I could absolutely see this race flipping to Democrats. It's an underrated race. No one really, everyone kind of rode off North Carolina f from the start with Ted Budd winning the nomination. But he doesn't seem to be getting his act together too much. And, you know, this race could potentially be a sleeper flip for the Democrats. The final lead in state I have is the state of Wisconsin. I had it as tilt Republican before. And look, Mandela Barnes has definitely impressed me. I think he has a you know, a better chance than expected at winning this race. You know, last time, you know, just a month ago, I had this race in his, you know, being favored for him. And, uh, you know, Wisconsin polls, though they are very inaccurate in presidential years, have been, you know, pretty good in midterm years. They were very, they were spot on in 2016, in 20, not 2016, they were very often 2016 and 2020. They were pretty much spot on in the governor and Senate races in 2018. But the fact, you know, I, I don't want to put this race in favor of Mandela Barnes anymore. You know, Republicans have really, you know, started to help Ron Johnson in this race. They've kind of realized that after that Trafalgar poll that came out, you know, showed them down, uh, showed Johnson down by two points. They kind of realized, oh, crap, we actually need to, you know, start attacking Barnes because everyone kind of took this race for granted. I never really said that Barnes was 
had no chance of winning this race, but, you know, through the, out the summer, I was pretty bullish on Johnson. And, you know, with him being up in the polling average, really just, you know, he's up by two points to 538, um, the 538 polling average. He's been winning these polls by quite a bit. You know, he's doing a lot better in polling than he was in 2016. I don't know, you know, I don't think he's going to win by over 5%. You know, I, I could have seen that a couple of months ago, but I think, you know, Johnson, I know the polls do typically over, way overestimate Democrats in Wisconsin, and the fact that they're already down is not a good sign for them at all. But I do think Johnson will win by around 2 or 3%, maybe 4%. As of right now, I think Barnes does well with Milwaukee turnout, but, you know, and, you know, he'll do a little bit better in Madison and, uh, you know, in Dane County. But I think the rest of the state shifts pretty far to the right. And, uh, yeah, I think Wisconsin, you know, with it already showing Barnes down, you know, putting Wisconsin as a blue state right now, I think that that's, the, I guess, an analogy I could make is to put Wisconsin as blue right now when Barnes is already down in the polling average in a state that almost always overestimates Democratic support, especially in presidential years, although, you know, it's a midterm year, that, that just really seems to me like jumping into a swamp with a crocodile screaming at you and a dead body in there. <laughs> I know it's a very interesting analogy, and Wisconsin's not necessarily a done deal for Democrats, but I just don't see it right now. Ron Johnson's doing a lot better than he was just a month ago in polling data, and uh, yeah, I think that he, you know, Trafalgar is pretty accurate in Wisconsin. They're pretty iffy in some other states, but Johnson, you know, is doing quite well in a lot of these polls. Barnes hasn't led it in, this, um, in any poll since uh, Siena College put out this poll about um, three weeks ago. So yes, yeah, so I think Wisconsin votes for Johnson by a lean margin. So now Democrats and Republicans are tied, 49 to 49. We have Nevada and Georgia, the two closest states, in my opinion, of the 2022 election cycle. These are the tilt states. You know, these are the states that are going to go to either party by one um, by less than one percentage point. Um, percentage point. You know, they they are very close. They really could go either way. Not to say that the lean states, you know, aren't are you know locked down for either party, but you know they are significantly higher. They've, um, you know, are significantly higher in terms of percentage for either party, you know, than uh, these tilt states. So I'm going to give uh, Nevada to Catherine Cortez Masto by a tilt margin. This gives Democrats 50 seats. So, you know, even if Republicans do flip Georgia, you know, um, you know, in my prediction, uh, you know, they, they already, you know, would, you know, still lose the uh, Senate majority. It would stay 50-50. Catherine Cortez Masto is having a lot of trouble in Nevada recently. You know, she is, you know, La Adam Laxalt is doing very well in polls. But we have to remember that, you know, Nevada is a state where polling has historically overestimated um, Republicans almost every time. You know, in 2020, it was the reverse. Um, it was, you know, a reverse scenario. You know, Republicans did a lot better in polling than expected in the state. But Nevada was a state, you know, Nevada was pretty much locked down. You know, Las Vegas, the economy in Nevada was pretty much dead. Um, you know, now that we're, you know, getting out of the pandemic, at least um, so it seems, I think that um, Nevada, you know, will... Um, you know, still, it'll, it'll turn, Las Vegas will be pretty solid for Catherine Cortez Masto, I think she'll outperform Biden's numbers in the state, she'll do well with Hispanics, I think Laxalt, you know, will do better in uh, Washoe, he'll probably win it by more than Joe Heck did in uh, 2016, um, you know, in abortion, you know, Roe v. Wade being on the ballot is going to help Cortez Masto, so, you know, I could see the state being lean, and Adam Laxalt's, you know, inability to win his attorney general's race in 2014, a red wave year, um, by a very strong margin was, you know, it, it, that's already a pretty big red flag for Laxalt. I don't think he's a terrible candidate. He's a lot better than Dr. Oz, you know, J.D. Vance, Mark, or not Mark Kelly, uh, Blake Masters. Um, but he still has, you know, some baggage and he's running in a state that's historically more democratic than a lot of other, um, than a lot of these other swing states. But I do think he'll make it closer than some of them. So I think the Cortez Masto wins by about a point as of right now. Could be lean. If it's 2.4% for Nevada, that would be so cursed because um, Nevada has a, that's a very popular margin in Nevada. That's how much Cortez Masto and Clinton won, in 26, won by in 2016 and how much Biden won by in 2020. But I do think Black Salt will make this race pretty, pretty close. And he absolutely could win it. It's just that Clark County is going to be very, you know, it's gonna he'd have to narrow up Clark County, you know, more than... You know, he'd have to improve in the rural mar in the uh, northern Nevada, the rural areas in Washoe, which I think he will, compared to Trump in 2016, or in 2020. 
but I do think Cortez Master will do slightly better than Biden in Clark County, which I think, you know, puts her over the top. So after all that rambling, we have just one state left. It's Georgia. I'm moving it down to Tilt Democratic. And, you know, I, I, you know, Herschel Walker is doing better than expected in some of these polls, you know, but Raphael Warnock is still, you know, Raphael Warnock is still doing very well in the polling data. He's up by 2.1%, which is how much he was up by, um, on, uh, you know, the runoff day, um, you know, um, on the day of the runoff in 2021, um, you know, and Warnock is doing, you know, there was a time when Walker, you know, about a month ago was doing pretty well in polling, but a lot of these pollsters did overestimate um, Trump and Kemp um, in 2020 and 2018, respectively. And Herschel Walker is just not a good candidate for Georgia. He's not going to have very good appeal in the suburbs. I think, you know, this race probably will go into a runoff, and I think Warnock will probably win that runoff by a couple of points. It'll be closer to likely D than it is to toss up or, you know, to tilt. But, you know, Walker could surprise us. He could win, um, you know, a majority of the, of the vote on Election Day if things get a lot better for Republicans in just a month, you know, and, you know, he wouldn't have to deal with a runoff then. He could win a runoff theoretically, but I just don't see it. You know, runoff elections in Georgia, you know, in, the, in uh, 2021, the um, electorate of those ele of the runoffs were a lot more democratic than uh, the general election was. In Georgia, you know, it isn't necessarily a ticket-splitting state. I get that Stacey Abrams is a strong candidate, but she just doesn't really seem to be doing nearly as well as Warnock is, you know. And Georgia does have a history of splitting, of somewhat splitting, you know, the margins, um, um, by which they've elected, you know, some of their, you know, by, um, in some of their concurrent elections, you know, like in Trump, uh, in 2016, Trump won the state by five points when Johnny Isaacson won by 14 points in a Senate election. And, you know, I know that Georgia was a lot redder six years ago than it is now. Um, and I, you know, it is getting a lot bluer, but I do think Warnock ekes out a narrow victory. Walker could absolutely win this race. But he's just, you know, he's really falling apart, and, you know, he will get better turnout, I think, than Kelly Laffler did in the uh, rural areas, and he could win the general election day vote, but even then, I don't think he gets over 50%. You know, I think the election day vote's pretty much a toss-up between Walker and Warnock, but I think, you know, it goes into a runoff, and then Walker, and then Warnock uh, wins by about three or four points. So, anyways, after all of that, um, the final map here, Democrats, um, are at 51 seats, Republicans at 49. Democrats win, um, you know, gain uh, a one seat in the Senate through Pennsylvania. They hold on to Nevada, Arizona, Georgia, and New Hampshire, as well as Colorado and the rest of the states on this map. Republicans win, um, hold on to all of their seats except for Pennsylvania. So yeah, so this is my current prediction. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. Hope it wasn't too long. Be sure to like and subscribe to the channel, share uh, share the video, turn on notifications so you don't miss another one. Check out my non-political channel, Interactor127, and my, um, you know, Comrades channel, Growlings is 666. Um, you know, we're getting super close to the midterms, guys. Um, you know, I'll start to make more videos about these um, individual Senate races. Hopefully, I can make um, some more... Uh, sorry, I'm saying a, a lot. Uh, hopefully, I can make some more videos for these Senate races, and hopefully I can make um, some more uh, Senate elections, or, you know, more uh, frequent uh, Senate updates. Sorry, I'm just really, you know, stumbling all over my words here. But uh, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I'll try to make some more, um, oh, uh, bleh. I'll try to make some more updates for these Senate elections as we get closer. Hopefully I can translate it to one week, or to, um, to uh, one one update every week, you know, instead of two weeks, but uh, we'll just have to see. I've got a busy month here in October. Um, you know, I've got a lot of time off, so hopefully, you know, I can, you know, make some, hopefully I can make some videos, and uh, yeah, we'll just continue uh, tracking these races. I'll continue to make videos about them, and uh, yeah, we'll see, I'll see you guys next time when I talk about all things politics. See ya.